Maatschappelijk hierbij, wordt van welkom hier bij ons uh, 107e verjaarsdagviering van de universiteit. En ook dan natuurlijk die uh, verwelkomingsboodschap uh, wat ons rector zal geven. Colleagues, I would like to welcome you to our 107th uh, celebration of the university birthday and also our uh, welcoming address from our vice-chancellor. A special word of welcome to our vice-chancellor that uh, is here with us. I've also noted some members of our executive that's with us. I've noted some deans, HODs, directors, staff, academic staff, support staff, all very important components of the university. A heartly word of welcome. Um, you know, when I th thought a little bit about the event, uh, I thought about how people think about special uh, periods in their lives. And it's, it's interesting how people connect uh, multiples of 10 as a very important date. So if you become 50 or if you celebrate your 100th of birthday or if you have a hundred in cricket or so forth, it's all always these multiples of 10. But I must tell you that the number 107 is actually a very interesting number. In the first place, it's actually a prime number. So for those of you that go back to your school days, will remember that this is a number which divides only itself and one and no other divider. So, but more interestingly is if you actually take uh, the number two, which is also a prime number, and you multiply it 107 times with itself, you get a 33-digit number. That's a huge number. And if you subtract one from that, it's also a prime number. <laughs> <laughs> Colleagues, prime numbers are actually much more exciting than those multiples of 10. Because for those of you that work in computer science will know that huge security systems are sort of built and based on prime numbers. For the people that's interested in chemistry will remember or know that the atomic number for borium is 107. And that's a radioactive metal that's not found in nature but can be uh, uh, constructed within a laboratory. The only one thing about borium is it only has a half, or the, let us say the most stable isotope only has a half-life of 61 seconds. For people that's here, uh, that's interested in the security of our campus, it's very interesting to note that uh, within Argentina and even Cape Town, but we won't mention that too much, um, 107 is the uh, security emergency telephone number. For the humanities colleagues with us here today, that currently there are 107 Nobel Prize winners or laureates in literature. And then, even for the people that's here for sport, or interested in sport, there's the 107% rule in Formula One qualifying sessions. Any driver who fails to set a lap within 107% of the fastest time will not be allowed to start the race. So I, I, I can go on and on, uh, uh, colleagues, but the number 107 is actually quite an exciting number. And this is the year 107, the birthday of the University of Pretoria. And I would like to request that all of us make the year 107 matter. What I'm going to do is I'm going to invite our Vice Chancellor to address us uh, in this wel welcoming event and then after that, we will uh, have some further celebrations in our Rotenbach Hall downstairs, and we will give you some information of what will happen. But welcome, and we are very excited about this address, and uh, we look forward for our uh, VC CEO to lead us into the new year and to give us some uh, di directors to what we, would, what, what we should actually focus on. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, colleagues, and thank you very much to Professor Antoine Struer, who um, you can tell, despite his new role in the executive of the university, hasn't forgotten his disciplinary home in mathematics. <laughs> Professor Struer, thank you very much for enlightening all of us about the meaning of the number 107, and I certainly, as a non-mathematics graduate, found it very interesting. Thank you. 
Colleagues, I want to thank you very much for being here this afternoon. As I look around the room, I recognize many colleagues who have been, who have been participants in the teaching and learning conference that was hosted by uh, Education, Innovation and Professor Norman Duncan earlier this year. It was a one and a half day event during which we focused on the theme e-learning. We then, as Senate members, had a different conference uh, focusing on matters that will be facing the Senate for 2015. And very recently this week, we had a workshop focusing on the University of Pretoria's strategy with respect to partnerships with other African countries. So there's been a, a sequence of conferences and events that me, and many of you I recognize have participated in all of them. And once again, thank you very much for devoting your time to these events in the life of our institution. Colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, one of the familiar habits that I'm sure we, we often ourselves, uh, and including at the beginning of this year, we enact, is that each year when we come back to work after our annual vacation or the December break, when we return to work and we see one another, we tend to greet one another by saying compliments of the new year, happy new year, or depending upon our language, we may say forsput for the year. And at a university function last night, I met someone who I saw, I saw for the first time last night since the beginning of this year. And the colleague said to me compliments, and he immediately stopped, frowned, and said, perhaps it's a bit late to wish you Happy New Year. And then I started wondering, when is it in fact too late? to say compliments of the new year. Is it the end of January? Is it the middle of January? Can we continue into February? But it seemed to me that there's no fixed date for this practice that we uh, enact every year. And in fact, we may look at it from a completely different cultural tradition, where in some parts of the world, new year is yet to come. So if, for example, we think about China, in the Chinese tradition, New Year will be celebrated on the 19th of February. And it will, there will also be celebrations here in Bronkospreit, in the city of Johannesburg, uh, at a number of festivities hosted by the local Chinese community. So I think we can still continue to say compliments of the New Year. So may I say compliments of the New Year to all of you. But in keeping with the Chinese tradition, when I read about the 19th of February and how the, the calendar works out for the Chinese New Year, in the same article, uh, they mentioned that in the Chinese tradition, this is the year of the sheep or the dog, sorry, the sheep or the goat. And in reading on about what this might mean, some of the astrologers were saying, a year that is the sheep, the year of the sheep or the goat tends to be a difficult year. And certainly for many of us as South Africans, and certainly for me, it has begun to feel like a difficult year. If we think about some of our headlines since the beginning of the year, there have been some horrific road accidents with many young children dying in these accidents. We've had robberies in shopping malls. When we look at our economic growth projections, they're all down. And then, as we all know, we're dealing with the daily life of load shedding. And as I've met people on campus this year, many people have said to me, or have asked me, what do I think about where things are going in South Africa? And there, there are challenges, particularly also if we look at the university sector and our situation. For us this year, our government subsidy has increased by only 2.7% compared to last year. Now, if you think about it, the official inflation figure, the latest we have says that our inflation is 5.9%, yet our subsidy has gone up by 2.7%. 
And then if you speak to Professor Kornov, Professor Foster, who are here, and you ask them, is this an adequate reflection? And they will say no, because what happens to us in the university is that our biggest expenses, like paying staff salaries, electricity, and water, each year has increased above the official inflation rate. And as we all know from our household circumstances, that we are going to be paying more for electricity this year. So in many ways, for many of us as South Africans, and for me in particular, 2015 does begin to feel like a, very, like a particularly difficult and challenging year. And each morning, when we look at the predictions or what Eskim is telling us for the day, and yesterday, for the first time, we had the news that we're in stage, f stage three load shedding. And I immediately thought that we have to have a group or set up a task team at the University of Pretoria to plan not only for stage three, but what will we do and how will we manage in the eventuality that we get to stage four. But it does occur to me that we need to remind ourselves that it is in times of dealing with adversity or when we face some of the most serious of life's challenges that our true character is revealed. Experiencing both good times and bad times is an essential part of our lives. And if I ask you to think back, each one of us, at our own life, we can think of some good times and we can think each of us in our own way of some very difficult times. And we do know that it's often during the most difficult times and how we come through it that we begin to understand what is most important to us. And we often say in the English language at least, this is when true character is formed. So as I think of the university at the beginning of the 2015 academic year, I think that we must be honest and say, yes, we are in difficult times with respect to certainly load shedding, with the national economic projections, with the respect to the university budget. But what's important is that we must keep focused on that which is most significant to the present and future of our institution. We must not be distracted by the hurdles that we may face along the journey to our vision UP 2025. If we look back in the short term, we began this journey in 2010. First, a series of discussions talking about and thinking about what we would like the university to be in the year 2025. Then we developed a strategy, documented it, took it through all the processes of the university, Senate, University Council, and at the beginning of 2012, we began the implementation on what I then described on the basis of a plan, do, review cycle. And each year we assess our performance, we revise the plan a bit in the light of changing circumstances, but we are continuing on that same journey we agreed to and began to implement in 2012. I believe we are very fortunate that as we continue along this journey, we were able to appoint someone of the caliber of Professor Anton Struer to take the leadership in the portfolio institutional planning and strategy. In the short time he's been in this role, he's demonstrated to all of us that he has a deep understanding of what is most important in the life of a university and how we should proceed now and in the future. And for this, I wish to thank him. But one of the questions you might be asking is where are we in the journey 2025? And to answer this question, I want to quote a few statistics. As most of you who have worked with me for a while know, 
I commonly and frequently talk about the importance of making judgments and decisions based on evidence, empirical evidence, and not simply on anecdote and storytelling. So let me share these statistics. Firstly, I'm very pleased that on one of the statistics that's most important to the university, the pass rate of our undergraduate students, for those who wrote examinations, we have improved from a pass rate of 80.3% in 2012 to 81.6% in 2014, despite some difficult circumstances in that period. But perhaps more important than pass rates in these tight economic times is the question of how are our students doing out there in the economy, especially immediately after graduation. And to assess our performance, we now conduct, conduct regular graduate surveys. And in the most recent one in 2014, we learned that about 91% of our graduates who left the university and did not continue into postgraduate studies found employment six months after graduation. We will be following them up to find out where they are a year later. Because one of the decisions young people and their parents and families have to make is whether continued investment in university education is worthwhile. So to my mind, that is one of the most important statistics that we must all watch and measure year after year. Are our graduates finding employment? Particularly, are they finding employment in the areas that will take them further in their life's aspirations? When it comes to research in the period 2012 to date, our total research output increased by 12.6% and the number of NRF rated researchers by 15.9%. So there too, we are on a strong upward curve in the rankings, and I always wish to point out that rankings are important not for ranking's sake, because they are used by people to assess the standing and stature of a university, including those people who are choosing which university to go to. So in 2013, we were very pleased to be once again included among the top 500 universities in the world in the QS rankings. But most importantly, and what is not often mentioned in the media, are two categories in those rankings, or two measures. But let me remind you that not all universities in the world qualify to be considered for ranking. The ranking systems only look at about 2,000 of all the many thousands of universities in the world. And of those 2,000, I think it's important to recognize the achievement of being included in the top 500. But even more importantly, in the measure for academic reputation worldwide, we were ranked 309 in the world. And even perhaps more importantly for our students, in the category employer reputation, in other words, how do employers view our graduates? we were ranked 289 globally, which suggests to us that our graduates are increasingly sought after both locally and abroad. Now, there are many more statistics that I could report on to you, but I don't wish to do so. I simply wish to, wish to give you some evidence to demonstrate that we are firmly on track in our UP 2025 journey. And I also wish to take this opportunity to express sincere appreciation to all our staff who have contributed to the positive and very pleasing performance of our university as a whole. And I wish to emphasize my appreciation to all our staff, because while we tend to measure that which academics are mostly focused on, teaching and learning and research, without the many and varied support services we offer our academics, that our support staff in particular offer our academics, they would not be able 
to focus on their teaching and learning and research. So it is indeed an expression of appreciation to everybody who plays a role in making us the proud university we can be today. But as is the case in life, when we think of a journey, we often start off full of energy and excitement. And the journey that comes to my mind is traveling to Cape Town by car from Pretoria. And you may have other journeys that you can think of. I'm not sure how you experience these journeys, particularly if you travel with children. But usually when you start out, start out perhaps at the year end, going on an annual vacation, everyone starts out really excited. But somewhere towards the middle of the journey, that excitement subsides. And we start looking at when are we going to get there. Very often along the way, we are faced with some hurdles and obstacles. We may have a flat tire. We might face extreme weather in the Karoo and other obstacles. And I want to liken this to our journey here at the university and suggest that what must be kept at the forefront of our thinking is that which is most important and we must remain focused on that vision and the plan that we've committed ourselves to. Because unless we do that, we will not reach that destination. There are many hurdles indeed, many possible distractions, but it's important that we don't allow them to diminish our energy and our tension. Because long journeys can only be successfully completed when they are tackled one step at a time. So today, as we look back at the journey that the university itself has followed since its establishment in 1908, some of us, and this morning, I started off my day by signing certificates of long service. Many colleagues have served here for 35 and more years. Some colleagues will, at the end of 2014, have served us for 10 years. So we can look back at our journeys at the University of Pretoria individually, and then we can look at the long life of the university as a whole, 107 years. And without going into detail, as we look back, the university has faced in the past some serious challenges. There have been political cha changes, times when the university was concerned about bomb threats. And in fact, if we think back to this very venue, the Aula, the Aula came about after students demonstrated in front of the then rector's office because they didn't have a hall or a place for student gatherings. There have been changes in leadership and many more along the 107 years that the university has followed to date. But I think we can honestly say that today as we look at ourselves, that we've not only survived the various changes in our country and the challenges the university has, to face, has had to face, but we've grown and over the years we've succeeded. Today, we are much more diverse than we have ever been before. We are more inclusive in our approach to how we do things. And as we've opened our doors to all talented young people, we have remained strongly focused on that which is most important to any university in the world, namely academic excellence. So when I talk about being focused on that which is most important, I am talking about issues of quality. Today, the University of Pretoria is one of the three universities in South Africa who time after time, in various surveys, comes up as one of three universities of choice for the most talented young South Africans 
from all communities in South Africa. The surveys that were conducted in 2014 by external agencies, not ourselves, have informed us that we are sought after because of our strong institutional reputation, because of the quality of education we offer, and the academic choices we offer our students. But most importantly, we are sought after because students and their families appreciate that when they come here, we all focus on that which is most important in the life of a university, and that is quality and academic excellence. This year, on our annual welcoming day, which was Saturday the 17th of January, I had once again the pleasure of welcoming our new first years and their families. Each one of them has come to us with a record of individual success. Each one of them has made their families proud. They've been the top or one of the top students in their school, one of the top students in their families. Last year, the statistics from our institutional planning department and education innovation showed us that over a third of our students are coming to the university as the first one in their family to ever enroll at a university. So today, as we think about what's most important to us, as we reflect on the challenges we face in our country, South Africa, I believe that we must commit ourselves to doing all we can to ensure that each one of the talented young South Africans who we register as University of Pretoria students have every possible chance of being the best they can be. Because if we are serious about changing the future of our country for the better, the best way we can make a contribution is to continue to produce high quality graduates who will become the professionals and the leaders of the future. And it's for this reason that this year we will continue to concentrate our fundraising efforts on scholarships and bursaries for academically deserving students. In the past, as I've shared with you, we've had considerable success. We, were, we have been awarded significant funding by US foundations, like the, Su the Michael and Susan Dell Foundation, by the Canadian MasterCard Foundation. And then last year, we started our own giving campaign, the Tuck Scholarship Campaign. I'm also very pleased to share with you that our alumni have heeded the call and are also organizing events to raise funds for academically meritorious and financially deserving students. And despite the pressure on the university's budget in 2015, we have made a decision that we must invest in scholarships and bursaries for students, top academic achievers, and those who are struggling to pay their fees. We are all familiar by reading the media about the issues facing the National Student Financial Aid Scheme. Very many of our students are affected by the issues around NSFAS. So to that end, we've also set aside a proportion of our own budget to assist academically deserving students. One of the planned realities, or sorry, the unplanned events that we now have to deal with is thinking about how we're going to manage the costs that are associated with the power outages. So as you know, over the years, we've installed many generators across the campus, but of course, it costs us to run this, these generators. Of course, there is some good news in the power outage story, story in that the price of diesel has come down. But that's the responsibility we have as leaders and managers of the university, to respond to unplanned events 
but in, in a way that does not compromise that which matters most to us as an institution. And it's very important for me, and I think for all the leaders of this university, to ensure that how we deal with the short-term issues does not compromise the long-term sustainability of the university. The university is 107 years today. We would like this university to grow and succeed over the decades to come so that it, when it celebrates its second centenary, it can look back and be proud of the actions we took today. So it's important for us as we deal with short-term challenges, and they are short-term, I want to remind us, because there's no challenge or no difficulty that lasts forever. As South Africans, we are a resilient nation. We know that as South Africans, when times are tough, when times are tight, we make plans to overcome those difficulties. And I believe as a university community, we will indeed do that. But as we should deal with the short term, we have to continue to think about UP 2025 and most importantly, the years beyond 2025. So you will see across the campus that one of the slogans or the calls that we made to our new 2015 students is to think about what they do each and every day. And when I spoke to the new 20, uh, 2015 students, I said to them, please do not be tempted to think about graduation as something you're going to do right far into the future. Because each day matters to whether you get closer to that point of celebration. And it's the same for us as a university. The decisions we make now in the short term will shape the future of this institution. I often think about why was it the case that in 1999, those who had the power to make the decision did not invest in new infrastructure to supply us with energy today? We must not be short term in our thinking. As we talk about 2015, and Professor Stroh will be meeting many of you to talk about the 2015 plan for the university, as he has already begun to do, we do recognize that there's much in our world which we do not have direct control. We certainly cannot control the past. When we look at the present, there are factors that we have very little control over but there are many things that we have direct control over. So I'm calling on each and every one of us to think about what we do have influence and control over and to use our energy to focus constructively on what matters most to the university. And on this occasion, let me repeat, what's most important to the university is what matters most to our students. Because by doing so, we will ensure that we graduate professionals and leaders who will create a better South Africa for all of us. And in these tight times, focusing on that which is most important for our students will require some sacrifice on our part. And already our finance team, under the leadership of Professor Kornov, has been talking to departments about reallocating costs and savings on energy and water and so forth, and they will continue to do so in the coming months. And they're doing this to deal with short-term difficulties, but very importantly, we are doing this because we care about the future of our students and the future of our institution. So let me remind us that those four principles that drive our strategy remain important today as they were when we began our journey in 2012. Our commitment to quality, our commitment 
to being relevant to changing times, our commitment to diversity in everything we do, and our commitment to the long-term sustainability of the university. It is these four principles that are key to the continued success of all of us and our institution. I'm sure that all of us know at least one young person, perhaps our children, our grandchildren, that we care deeply about. As many of you may know, I don't have children, but I do have a grandnephew who's three years old, and I spend a lot of time with him. And what I think about each day, and I'm asking you to think about, is what can each of us do to make sure when a three-year-old or the 10-year-old or your grandchildren to come will in the future, when they make a choice about which university they wish to go to, will choose to come to the University of Pretoria because it's the best university in the world. Thank you very much. Colleagues, it's always interesting for me to listen to the economic analyzers when the Minister of uh, Finance makes his budget speech uh, for the year available. And the, the big question always is, is the, the outcomes of the speech realistic in terms of all the challenges that exist and so forth? I think what we've heard here from our Vice-Chancellor today is that given the global trends that we have that, and the challenges to sustain uh, the university in the future, all the competition that exists, the uh, subsidy uh, decreases that uh, universities experience. So she actually sketched for us a picture of the future of the university that could sustain all of that. And also uh, gave evidence to already uh, uh, specific uh, performance uh, uh, statistics that, uh, that, that supports that. So I really think we should really thank Professor De La Rey again for, for a very realistic uh, approach towards the uh, future of the university and also the academic opening of this uh, academic year, and that we all will support her in her vision to ensure that, that we actually will make this year uh, matter. Thank you very much, Professor De La Rey. When I sat here listening to the speech, actually one thing that came to my mind is that in the institutional plan for 2015, we actually identified seven uh, priorities. So we said that we have to sharpen the focus and so forth. And the first of those is to significantly increase our visibility through our uh, high impact research, our scholarly endeavors and so forth. And uh, looking at uh, the people that joined us here today, there's one group of uh, our, com our community that demonstrated that very well, and that is uh, our facilities group. If you see, our, they are very visible. Just look at them there <laughs> under the leadership of Professor Susan Arendorf. But of course, if you take that step, you, you are now visible. So they actually pledge that this year, they are going to do extremely high quality work and support you in all your endeavors because you will, you will see them, you will notice them and so forth. So thank you very much, uh, Professor Susan Arendorf, for, for, for that uh, innovative uh, event. <laughs>